good morning uh, we're going to discuss about uh, bronchial asthma uh, I think the cough both the dry cough and productive cough has been discussed earlier so another common condition which affect the respiratory tract or uh, the respiratory system is the bronchial asthma of course uh, many of us are experienced the problem in different degree maybe some people would have uh, affected in a mild way and some people still having the problem and some people can have uh, the worst scenario of bronchial asthma it depends the conditions all right so uh, it's need not to be explained like how it could be a uh, the condition affect the person's uh, day to day life especially the quality of life so definitely this is a condition where we need to address properly asthma is a disease of reversible airflow obstruction manifested by paroxysms of these features one is wheezing breathlessness chest tightness and cough so these are the major or the hallmark features of asthmatic patients wheezing breathlessness chest tightness and cough it's a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways that is characterized by so what are the characteristics of bronchial asthma we, we know that uh, the more most important features are or the characteristics are hypertrophy of smooth muscles especially the tracheobronchial smooth muscle hypertrophy bronchospasm that's why the person will have wheezing difficulty to breathe the easiness of the breath may loss inflammation increased mucus secretion and mucosal edema so edema the secretion of the mucus inflammation all together can have a worst scenario now here the picture shows the normal uh, bronchial muscles and the tracheobronchial airway flow and the b shows the asthmatic patient b shows the asthmatic patient over here let's see the epidemiology which is not very uh, important for us like it's not the uh, it's not our cup of tea but still uh, <clears throat> primary asthma uh, the pathophysiology the pathology of the asthma uh, affect the terminal bronchioles it is the most common respiratory or the chronic respiratory disease in the in children so the prevalence is more among children than adults 50 to 80 percent develop symptoms before five years of age so uh, that's why i told you like your childhood had this experience already had the experience of asthmatic episodes there are two types one is extrinsic and the other one is intrinsic so there are two types of asthma uh, first one is extrinsic and second one is ex intrinsic asthma now let's see what is extrinsic asthma the pathogenesis like how uh, the extrinsic asthma is differ from intrinsic asthma so the extrinsic asthma uh, is uh, developed by the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction with exposure to extrinsic allergens means the uh, outside allergen the pollutants pollen grains drugs and various any exogenous or the xenobiotics which elicit your immunological reaction by uh, eliciting the reactive reagenic IgE that IgE get deposited on the mast cells and leads to uh, the lay after latent period if the same antigen a person exposed to the same antigen the antigen antibody reaction takes place and which causes the type 1 as hypersensitive reaction Uh, this is typically developed in children with an atopic family history to allergies initial sens sensitization to an inhaled aller allergen this is what i told uh, that latent period uh, after the first exposure there is a latent period required uh, followed by the re exposure elicit this reaction so which actually stimulate the induction of cd4 t2h that release the interleukins il4 and il5 and you know uh, interleukins are the inflammatory mediators which is the most potent bronchoconstrictive agent bronchospastic 
agent. So we have histamine, of course histamine is a bronchospastic, but interle uh, interleukin, not in the, I'm sorry, not interleukin, uh, which in turn leads to release of leukotrienes. I'm sorry, I had an impression that it's a uh, interleukin, but uh, leukotrienes, actually it is leukotrienes. Okay, now this is in the, uh, interleukin and further leukotrienes and histamine, prostaglandins, all the other inflammatory mediators uh, will be released and among these, Leukotrains are the most potent bronchospastic agent. This is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, so this can uh, switching to Ig production. Interleukin five stimulates production and activation of eosinophils. So this is a cascade uh, pathway. One by one, these all the inflammatory mediators involved in the hypersensitivity reaction and uh, uh, the inflammation process uh, edematous process everything will be released uh, step by step, uh, step as a cascade pathway and eventually it precipitate the bronchospasm uh, inflammation secretion edema etc so this is the uh, pictorial representation antigen is coming to the peripheral lymphoid tissue ige the reagenic antibody ige is generated over here then uh, the mast cells get sensitized and uh, again the re-exposure leads to all these histamine, leukotrain, prostaglandin, Ig, all the secretion. So here the picture shows how this uh, allergen interact with the immuno cells and how it causes uh, uh, what does the effect of these uh, mediators on the airway epithelial cells so in normal individual this is what happened and in asthmatic individuals interleukin 4 activate the t lympho uh, t cells and further steps may be taken place now the second one is intrinsic asthma so intrinsic asthma is the non-immune the type 1 I mean not type 1 the extrinsic the first two type you discussed was about in extrinsic asthma and uh, which is uh, having a antigen antibody basis for the uh, precipitation of asthma now regarding intrinsic asthma there is no immune component and it causes virus induced respiratory infections uh, rhinovirus okay para influenza virus rsv virus means a respiratory syncytial virus rsv virus air pollutions okay the pollutants in the air pollution o3 free radicals the o2 combining with the oxides of nitrogen and sulfur this is very common among uh, our metro cities where the high pollution air pollution uh, due to the uh, combustion of the hydrocarbon fuel like petrol diesel etc so uh, in uh, people who residing at delhi mumbai and all the chances for the intrinsic asthma the incidence of intrinsic asthma is very high especially in the uh, child age group less than five year old aspirin or nsid uh, related allergy can also produce intrinsic asthma Stress, exercise, cigarette smoke, another other uh, factors are stress, exercise, cigarette smoke, etc. So uh, the, these are the two uh, types based on the pathophysiology. One is immune, that is the extrinsic, and the intrinsic is non-immune. Especially, it is due to virus pollution, etc. And the drug-induced uh, allergic reactions. Now, asthma can be divided classify according to its severity so you can see intermittent less than two days per week the peak expiratory flow airflow is near normal mild persistent more than two days per week and not daily moderate persistent daily uh, so the peak expiratory flow reach only up to 80 percentage it is not normal Severe persistent, continual. So the attack of the asthma will be continuous 
and uh, usually the peak expiratory flow will be less than 60 percentage so here it is uh, the last one is also called persistent chronic persistent is also called status asthmaticus now the pulmonary delivery like uh, uh, unlike many other uh, medications uh, respiratory uh, administration of the drug have different formulations uh, prefer like generally for the acute termination of acute attack we always prefer inhalation route it's a preferred route of delivery especially in asthma and COPD especially in the acute attack cases the only way to deliver some drugs such as chromolin sodium and anticholinergic drugs which is only available as the inhaled route preparations chromolin metadose inhaler or the rota inhaler preparations are available no oral preparations of chromolin is available uh, some respiratory sepsis chronic conditions uh, cystic fibrosis and all some antibiotics are also administered through the pulmonary delivery now this is the pictorial representation you can see this is called mdi mdi stands for meter dose inhaler you know well about this uh, device and when you take orally and people have a misunderstanding that this is supposed to be taken through nasal route no it has to be administered through the oral route when you inhale some will press the uh, meet mdi simultaneous there, be, there should be a synchronization of the inhalation and that uh, enable the entry of 20 up to 20 percentage of the drug directly into the lungs and remaining 80 to 90 percent uh, percentage come to the uh, gi tract and get absorbed so the acute effect will be due to uh, the 20 percentage directly entered into the lungs which act at the target sites so this is how the method schematic representation of the deposition of the inhaled drugs so here this is what i wanted to tell you sometimes like uh, people used to ask what percentage of the drug can directly enter into the lungs after the uh, uh, administration through a meter dose inhaler now uh, some important delivery devices these things will be discussed under practical session we have pressurized meter dose inhaler that is pmdis which is very common uh, spacer chambers, dry powder inhalers, nebulizers, uh, pressurized meter dose inhaler. This is what uh, uh, is uh, drug is propelled from a canister. Canister is that uh, uh, cartridge type. Previously, the propellant used was Freon, okay, which is rich of uh, it is a CFC uh, component. Now we it, we use the uh, ozone friendly substances. And this is what I told you coordination of inhalation with the activation of the devices just pressing the canister synchronized with the inhalation now another one is spacer chamber so this is the spacer where the canister connect to the spacer so uh, the spacer it has an advantage here you can see the large particles of the aerosols are deposited in the chamber before the uh, patient inhales. Uh, inhaled aerosol is enriched in small particles that more readily travel to the small airways. Okay, so uh, the accessibility to the deeper areas of the lungs can be improved by using the spacer. Okay, so this is the advantage of using spacer which helps to sediment the larger particle size where the smaller particle size can fa move faster and enter access into the small capillaries which can cross the membrane easily means the epithelial barrier between the alveoli and the capillaries can be crossed easily if the particle size is very less so this is the advantage of using a spacer uh, connecting to the mdi now uh, drug may be also delivered as a dry powder which is encapsulated in a capsule uh, this uh, device may be preferred by some patients call, uh, because careful coordination is not as necessary as when the uh, pressurized meter dose inhaler but some patients find that dry powder is an irritant see what happened uh, 
we use something called rotahaler and this dry powder capsule can be crushed just rotation i will show you during the practical hours how to use a Now, uh, before we start the individual drugs, I just wanna, I just wanna tell you the basic uh, in inflammatory mediators and its origin. So we all know that membrane, cell membrane contain rich of phospholipids. This can be converted into arachidonic acid by phospholipase A2 is an enzyme. This enzyme converts the membrane lipids into arachidonic acid and this is the precursor for many inter, uh, inflammatory mediators in our body which includes the leukotrains, prostaglandins. Okay. Now, uh, if uh, the arachidonic acid is acted by lipoxinase, if the lipoxinase act on arachidonic acid which get converted into leukotrains. Okay. Now, uh, if the arachidonic acid is acted, uh, uh, means cyclooxygenase acts on the arachidonic acids what happened? It produced uh, prostaglandins. And please remember, these all enzymes, whether it is phospholipase A2 or lipoxinase A2 or cyclooxygenase enzymes, all are the target of asthma therapy. We in the th asthma, we use uh, various drugs to prevent the generation of these inflammatory mediators like uh, leukotrains, prostaglandins, etc. And please believe that these are the important culprit of precipitation of asthma or the progression of asthma. Apart from this, enzyme inhibitors, we also have certain receptor antagonists which can be uh, used to block the actions of these potent bronchospastic inflammatory mediators. Examples like leukotrins. We have leukotrin antagonists as we as I mentioned here, uh, Mondilucast and Zafirlucast, uh, and then. Uh, Prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors are also targeted, but asthma, uh, as far as the asthma is concerned, leukotriene has got a significant role, the remarkable role. So we may mainly target the leukotrienes and its pathways. Now let's talk about the drugs used in asthma. So uh, we have uh, different groups of drugs. Now let's con classify into bronchodilators anti-inflammatory agents and leukotriene uh, antagonist so leukotriene antagonist uh, as such we cannot consider as uh, as a pure inflammatory and inflammatory agents but in some textbooks it is considered as a leukot uh, and inflammatory agents now let's see which are the bronchodilators we have beta 2 agonists we have discussed the uh, location of beta 2 receptors which is predominantly on the tracheobronchial gland and then of course you know the muscarinic blockers role of muscarinic blockers and uh, muscarinic blockers are also uh, or you know the role of muscarinic m3 receptors in the tracheobronchial tree which stimulation of the receptor causes bronchospasm and we will be blocking this actions of the stimulation or actions of the agonist like acetylcholine so that it can produce a sort of uh, bronchial relaxation then methyl xanthines uh, like uh, uh, theophylline and its congeners which are nat uh, congeners of the natural products like uh, caffeine, uh, thiobromide etc. So these are also uh, produce a sort of bronchial relaxation. That's why it is classified under bronchodilators. Now anti-inflammatory agents have a distinct role because we have seen that this is a uh, intense inflammatory condition and of course, the inflammatory mediators has got significant role. Hence, we target the progression of the inflammatory process by several means, which includes the mast cell stabilizers because, you know, the uh, mast cells are the uh, targeting uh, or the depositing area of histamine mainly. And the histamine eventually uh, induce the gene or the uh, generation of the leukotrains. Then steroids, of course, uh, steroids are potent inflammatory and inflammatory agents. And the most important actions of steroids includes the uh, includes the uh, conversion of membrane phospholipid into arachidonic acid. I have shown a short there. The phospholipase A2 is the enzyme that can be inhibited by steroids. And of course, not just 
uh, there the steroids have various other role which includes the uh, inflammatory pro process so steroid has a potent anti inflammatory agent hence it is widely accepted drugs now it is the first line drug for the treatment of asthma but it is not systemically used it is preferred to use uh, the nas trans uh, nasal route inhalation route then we have anti ig antibody you have seen the role of reagenic ro role of uh, reagenic antibody ige therefore uh, blocking the ige antibody it is called mono and uh, monoclonal antibodies we have only one drug currently that is mono uh, uh, anti omalizumab then leukotriene antagonist we have uh, the enzyme inhibitor which is the uh, arachidonic acid into leukotriene conversion done by lipoxinase enzyme so the inhibitor is there then uh, we have leukotriene receptor antagonist leukotriene receptor antagonist so these are the various group of drugs used in asthma now uh, let's see the strategies of asthmatic management so usually the acute asthmatic episodes of bronchospasm must be treated promptly and effectively with the bronchodilators so this is what i told you bronchodilators are mainly preferred for the termination of the acute attack of asthma and this is generally referred as reliever drugs uh, the commonly used drugs includes beta 2 agonists muscarinic antagonists and theophylline theophylline belongs to the uh, methylxanthine group it is the congeners of caffeine and it's a central stimulant cna stimulant 2 and its derivatives are available for its this indication for the acute termination of the as asthmatic attack then second one is long term preventive treatment it is prophylactic or the controller drugs to prevent the acute attack especially when a person uh, exposed to the when a person exposed to the uh, risk factors or the triggering factors like uh, extreme weather pollutants or uh, climate etc so that group of that group of drugs are generally called as prophylactic agents which never which can be used for the uh, termination of attack instead is always used for the prophylactic purpose the most uh, important anti inflammatory drugs in the treatment of chronic asthma are the corticosteroids of course this comes the first line mastel stabilizers like chromolin and nidocromil of course it has got a, a potent a potential prophylactic role long long acting beta 2 agonist can improve the response to corticosteroids so generally uh, when you talk about the beta 2 agonist there are two groups short acting drugs which are preferred for the uh, termination of the asthmatic attack and long acting drugs are preferred for the uh, term, uh, prophylactic purposes because long acting beta 2 agonist uh, its uh, duration of action is longer as well as the onset of action is slow so for the termination of attack we require a fast onset drug action uh, a fast acting drug which is generally the short acting drug and uh, the omalizumab it's a monoclonal antibody against ige and uh, it also appears promising for chronic therapy for the prophylactic therapy the leukotriene antagonist we have uh, leukotriene antagonist examples like mondilucas and zafirlucas which is commonly used for the prophylactic purpose now here this is again the same uh, uh, schematic diagram which shows that exposure to antigen the first intervention is to avoid the uh, precipitating factors so for example dust pollen grains extreme weather etc so first uh, strategy is to avoid the exposure now second thing uh, the immunological processing which includes the uh, drugs like chromolin steroids zolotone antibody so chromolin is a mastel stabilizer steroids of course you know then zolotone is a lipoxinase enzyme inhibitor which is the enzyme responsible for the conversion of arachidonic acid into leukotriene and antibody is the monoclonal antibody we have omalizumab uh, then the mediators uh, early response bronchoconstriction can be blocked by drugs like uh, uh, short acting beta 2 agonist theophylline uh, 
muscarinic antagonists like uh, ipratropium bromide and tiatropium bromide. Antagonists of leukotriene uh, uh, receptors include Mondilucas and Zafirlucas. And the uh, other pathway like late responses are prevented by steroids, chromoling, uh, which is the mast cell stabilizers and leukotriene antagonist examples as I already told you, Zafirlucas and Mondilucas. So this is the pathway or the schematic representation which actually clearly represents here. Now let's talk about the uh, methyl xanthines. Here you can see the pathway. How does methyl xanthine act as a uh, smooth muscle relaxants? There are different mechanisms, different hypotheses, or different concepts which can contribute the smooth muscle relaxant properties of the uh, uh, properties of the uh, methyl xanthine. And many members of methyl xanthines include uh, theophylline, deriphylin, etc. So what exactly this drug will do? Uh, you know the cyclic AMP is the second messenger which is involved in the various intra intracellular pathway. Now uh, cyclic AMP is rapidly metabolized by an enzyme called phosphodiesterase into AMP. Okay, cyclic AMP is metabolized into AMP by an enzyme called phosphodiesterase enzyme and theophylline or its congeners, the methyl sanding derivatives uh, generally inhibit phosphodiesterase enzyme. Hence, what happened? The cyclic AMP level remain constant in the cell, which causes bronchial relaxation. The cyclic AMP directly involved in the or inhibit the myosin light chain kinase enzyme, and therefore it produces uh, smooth muscle relaxation. Not just smooth muscle relaxation; it also contribute to various other aspects, uh, which include. Uh, we'll discuss that uh, one by one. Uh, I just mentioned the major mechanism. Now, the first group of drugs are beta adrenergic receptors, agonists. So, we use selective beta 2 agonists uh, generally for this purposes. Epinephrine uh, or the norepinephrine, uh, means which includes the uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline, once upon a time was used, but it is non specific. It not only acts on beta 2 receptors, but also acts on the other. Receptors includes alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, etc. And now uh, may precipitate several untoward effects. So that has to be taken care. Therefore, we have developed a selective beta 2 agonist, selective beta 2 agonist, which is specific to the uh, bronchial uh, smooth muscle, where the beta 2 receptors are predominantly present at the uh, location. So uh, we use the selective beta 2 agonist. Uh, Terbutaline, albuterol, uh, albuterol is also called salbutamol or generally salbutamol is a commonly used term. Al the other term of this salbutamol is albuterol and metoprotonol are short acting. Therefore, it is useful for what? For the acute termination of acute asthmatic attack. Salmetron and formetrol are long acting. It is called LABA, long acting beta agonist. So, salmetrol and formetrol is long acting plus having a slow onset of action. So, it cannot be used for the termination of acute attack because it will take time to act therefore it is always used for the prophylactic purpose so laba stands for long acting beta agonist and salmetrol formetrol are the two agents used so this uh, agonists are given almost exclusively by inhalation usually from uh, that metadose inhaler uh, but occasionally by nebulizer in severe cases where uh, the congestion is present and we need uh, nebulization definitely you may go for uh, use of nebulizer generally the inhalation route decreases a systematic dose uh, because you know uh, the adverse effects profile is less compared to, uh, compared to the uh, oral medication and uh, as I have shown that when it is given as inhalation route 20% of the drug directly deposited to the tracheobronchial tree and including alveoli and immediate or the prompt effect will be uh, manifested. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the older drugs have durations of actions of 6 or less. Uh, Salmetrol and Formetrol which is considered as the LABA, long acting beta 2 agonist, act for, act for 12 hours or more. So that, therefore, 
uh, it can uh, cover nearly round the clock so uh, the structure is not recorded okay and mechanism symbol uh, we have discussed i don't want to explain that uh, beta 2 receptors is a g protein couple receptors and the beta 2 agonist whether it is salbutamol or what undergo conformation changes which uh, activate the g protein inside the cell the cellular uh, domain and uh, uh, which uh, replace the gdp with the gtp and activate cyclic amp from atp or uh, convert atp into cyclic amp what happened this will be uh, uh, the pathway cyclic amp pathway will be activated and eventually leads to bronchodilatation this is what we have discussed in the autonomic nervous system so which increase all these are the uh, the protein kinase a increase calcium activated potassium channel activation phosph decrease phospholipase c ip3 calcium pathway sodium calcium okay and mlck for so this is about the 